For our second video in chapter three, we want to take a look at the subgroup tests. We're actually going to look at three different subgroup tests, one specific to finite groups, but we're going to start with the one-step subgroup test, which could be used for a finite or infinite group. This subgroup test says, let G be a group and H be a non-empty subset of G. So the first key fact here is that it's non-empty. So when we talk about how to prove it, that's going to be our first step. We have to show that H is not empty or that H is not the empty set. In order to prove this, we're going to say that if A, B inverse is an H, for any A, B, and H, then H is a subgroup of G. So essentially, we're going to let this be true. We're going to let A and B both be elements of H, which is the subgroup. We have to show that what is then true is that A times B inverse is also in H. Now, I'm not going to go through the validity of the subgroup test. There is a proof in your textbook on page 62. You're welcome to go through that. I wanted to focus more on actually using the subgroup test in a proof. We're going to do a proof using the one-step subgroup test, and I've actually chosen to do the exact same proof for the one-step test and the two-step test, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, just so you can see how those proofs are the same and how they are different. So what we're trying to prove is we're saying that G is an abelian group, and remember abelian just tells us that AB is equal to BA for all A, B, and G. So essentially we're saying that it's a commutative group with identity E prove that H, which is the subgroup defined as all X's in G such that X squared is equal to the identity, or essentially all elements of order two, where I perform the operation twice to get back to the identity, is a subgroup of G. So again, how am I supposed to prove that? Well, my first is I have to show that H is non-empty. And it's a really good idea just to keep yourself um, organized as you're doing these proofs. Now, in, as the proof in the textbook, they're just going to write it as a paragraph, and that's fine too. That's the more mathematically standard way. Um, I'm sort of just an organizational dork, and I need to see very clearly this is me proving it's not empty. So that's me showing number one. So how am I going to show that H is not empty? Well, first, E is an element of G, and E squared, which is equal to E, would have to be an element of H. Again, why did I choose that? Because that's the definition of H, is all of the X's in G such that X squared is equal to the inverse. Uh, I'm sorry, the identity. So obviously the identity squared is equal to the identity and therefore E is an H. Therefore, H is not the empty set. Or you could just say H is not empty. My second step is closure. So closure says that A, B are going to be an H and I have to show that A, B inverse are an H. So I'm going to let A and B be elements of G, I'm sorry, of H. So if A and B are elements of H, then I can say that A squared is equal to E and B squared is equal to E. Again, based on the definition of the subgroup or subset H. So both of those are true. Now, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that AB inverse is an H. So I'm going to say, since G is abelian, then AB inverse, remember that's what I'm trying to do, squared is equal to AB inverse times AB inverse, because it's abelian, B inverse A is the same as AB inverse, so I'm just basically switching the order. AB inverse, AB inverse, 
that gives me a squared b to the negative 2. Well, I'm going to rewrite b to the negative 2 as b squared to the negative 1. Well, a squared, as we know um, from right here, is the identity. And b squared, as we know, is the identity. So the inverse of the identity is the identity. So essentially, that gives me the identity. Therefore, I have just proved that a b inverse is an element of, not g, of h. So I would finish the, the proof by saying by the one step subgroup test H is a subgroup of G. The two-step subgroup test is very similar. And in fact, what it does is it starts the same way. We still have to show that H is non-empty subset of G, but then we're actually sort of splitting up the second part of the proof into two parts. So in this case, we're going to show closure by multiplication. So if A, B is an H, whenever a and b are both in h, so we're saying the multiplicative closure, and a inverse is an h whenever a is an h. So if a is an h, a inverse is an h, if a b are an h, a times b are an h. So really it's just splitting that into two separate parts. Is it closed under multiplication? Is it closed under inverses? So you might be thinking, why would I ever do it that way? Well, sometimes it's easier, which doesn't make sense, but sometimes it is easier to show it um, by separating those into two different steps. So we're going to do the exact same proof that we did before, uh, now using the two-step subgroup test. We're now going to prove the same statement that we did with the one-step subgroup test, this time using the two-step subgroup test. So again, first thing I'm looking for is non-empty which is essentially me showing that the inverse is in fact going to be in H. So since E squared is equal to E, which would be an element of H, H is not the empty set. So again, notice I'm using sentences, even though I'm not using a ton of words, this is a sentence. So don't just show me a lot of work, make sure that I can follow your train of thought. Two, I'm looking for closure under the operation. In this case, that's multiplication. So how am I going to show that? How do I do it? Well, I'm just going to follow the format. Let A and B be elements of H. In this case, oh, such that A squared and B squared are also in H, because obviously that's the identity and those are going to be in H. Then A squared B squared multiplying two values equals, because it's abelian, AB AB is equal to AB squared. Well, that's going to be an element of H. So I've just shown closure. I've shown exactly this. A, B are elements of H, so therefore A, B squared is an element of H, and A, B is an element of H. So I've shown number two. Now let's look at number three. Number three says closure of inverses. So I'm going to say let A be an element of H, then A squared is an element of H. A, oh, let me say, then A squared inverse is equal, because I'm trying to show that A inverse is an H. So A squared inverse is equal to A inverse squared which is an element of H. 
So therefore, by the two-step subgroup test, H is a subset of G. Before we look at that last subgroup test, I do want to talk about how to disprove that something is a subgroup or show that a subset is not a subgroup. And it's not rocket science. It's just the same three things that we've been checking. You just have to show that one of those things is not true. So either H is the empty set, which means it doesn't include the identity, that the inverse of an element is not in the set, or that the product or sum, so the, it's not closed, so not closed under inverses, or not closed under the operation, usually multiplication, but could be addition. So fairly straightforward. Again, you could structure it the exact same way, but if you're doing the proof and you already know that it's not going to be met, just go straight to the end. So let radical two be an element of H. So is that valid? Well, H is all of the elements of X such that, I'm sorry, all of the elements X of G such that X is either one or X is irrational. So is X irrational? Yes. So what I've done is valid. Now, keep in mind that the set, the original set, the original group is the non-zero reals. So any real number that's non-zero, the implied operation is multiplication. So I'm saying let two be an element of H. Then radical two times radical two is equal to two, but two is not an element, I'm sorry, not an element of H because two is not one or irrational. So H is not a subgroup of G. Or we could say H is not a subgroup of G because it is not closed under multiplication. Our last subgroup test actually only works for finite subgroups. And if you'll notice, this looks very similar to our two-step subgroup test, um, except that we don't have to show closure of inverses. So if you look in your textbook, again, I'm not going to go through the proofs of each of the tests, but on page 64 in your textbook, it does prove that the inverse of every element of a finite group is in the subgroup. So basically, we just have to show closure of the, I'm sorry, non-empty, of course, and then closure of the operation. So if we're looking back at U15 um, and the subgroup H1, 2, 4, and 8, again, how do we show closure uh, under the operation? Again, all we have to do in this case, because it's a finite group, it's pretty easy. You could do a more um, abstract proof, but really, I can show that if I perform these operations, that all of the elements are going to be in the um, subset H. So eight times two is 16, which is one. And then four times eight is two, and eight times eight is 64 or four. And we can see that this is in fact closed under the operation of multiplication mod 15. We will finish up chapter three in the next video by looking at two examples of subgroups. One is the cyclic subgroup and the other is the center.